Good morning everyone and welcome to this meeting of the Council. Before we start, I just want to run through the fire alarm drill with you. We're not expecting a fire alarm test this morning, so if the fire alarm goes off, there's a fire exit in that corner, there's a fire exit in that corner, and there's a fire exit in that corner over there. At this stage, I normally remind everyone that the meeting will be shown live on the internet. However, due to problems with BT, our broadband provider, we will be unable to stream this morning's proceedings live. The meeting will be recorded as usual. The recording will be uploaded to the Council's webcast archive after the meeting and will be available for viewing at a later date. I will suspend and stop filming if, in my opinion, allowing filming to be continued would affect the proceedings of the meeting. Finally, can I issue the usual reminder about switching, off, switching microphones on before speaking and switching them off immediately after and when finished speaking? <laughs> Item 1, apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence? Thank you, Provost. Apologies this morning from Councillor Waters. Thank you. Uh, item 2, declarations of interest. The Council's Code of Conduct requires elected members to declare any financial or non-financial interest they may have in any of the items of the, on the agenda. I will declare an interest in the Leisure Trust. I would also like to declare a non-financial interest in any of the agenda items pertaining to the Centreshire Community and Leisure Trust. Provost, I declare the same uh, situation with Leisure Trust. Uh, declare the same interest as the previous councillors. Thank you. I think that's all. Item 3, the minute of the meeting of the Council held on the 14th of December 2016 is submitted for approval as a correct record and for signature. Is that in order? Councillor Grant? Uh, thank you, Provost. If I, I could just ask the clerk for some clarity here. Um, uh, starting on page 2150, um, it, it's to do with the, the notice of motion. What I need some clarity about is, is it, is the minute telling us that at the end of that whole procedure that the that my motion was carried with the amendment of councillor O'Kane added on to it is that what that whole minute is telling us thank you Provost. that's correct councillor grant thank you Provost, for that in that case i don't have anything further to say except that i'm glad the amend that the amendment didn't stop my motion going through Thank you. Is it order to approve item 3? The minutes of the meetings of the period the 15th December 2016 to the 8th of February 2017 are submitted for approval as a correct record. Is that in order? Does anyone have any questions on the minutes? No. Item 5. Items remitted to the Council. We have two items remitted to the meeting this morning. Introduction of off-street off parking charges. This report has been remitted from the Cabinet on the 26th of January. The Council is being asked to agree not to proceed with the introduction of off-street parking charges and has instructed the Director of the Environment to bring a report to a future meeting to make a, and confirm the traffic order in part to bring into force the regulations. Can you approve the recommendations? Councillor Robertson. Thank you. What a surprise that this has been taken off just now with an election coming up. I wonder whether or not yeah. they'll be back on quite early after the May elections or you'll actually listen to residents and continue to see it through, which also takes me on to the other bit. Surprise, surprise, audit and house which you put down for a saving where you hadn't listened to residents because I've not found one resident that's interested in that. That's not, the Councillor Robertson, Warrington House isn't on this item at the moment. It is relevant. It's relevant no. that you... Right, right, sorry. Councillor Robertson, not, not in this item at the moment. Right, this is I'm, about off-street parking charges. Okay then, I'm delighted to hear that you've listened to residents and would hope that you listen to them and consider what other things that come up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Robertson, 
Tell us something, Tasco. Yes, I'd like to fully associate myself with Councillor Robertson's comments in this regard. We can all describe it as a council acting better late than never. <laughs> Thank you, Provost. I'd like to address some of the uh, comments by Councillor Fletcher. Uh, the cost of setup is around 144,000, and the cost of maintenance is around 70,000. So there's definitely costs attached to charging for parking, uh, and both of these estimates are from Freedom of Information requests. The revenue estimates are, are however, significantly less certain. We know that only four ca car parks have actually been surveyed. All the assumptions are based upon these four car parts for all the other car parts, and the levels of displacement come from another council, so we have no idea about displacement, and that's fair enough, but we've applied that universally. The broom shops, because I do know about the broom shops, I park there quite a lot, and it's in my ward. The revenue forecast for there is £24,000. Broomburn was not surveyed. Almost all the people that park there for any time are the staff, or residents. I think this is quite important to set the context of what we're trying to do. In short, actually, almost nobody would pay for parking if this went ahead in the Broomburn shops. So the £24,000 revenue forecast for this particular site Council is a nonsensical one. Council Swift. No, wait, could you have, what is your question? My we are question saying is, here that we're not going to proceed with the I understand that, okay. but we're going to proceed, funnily enough, just a bit later, just a wee bit later perhaps than the election, as Councillor Robertson uh, raised. Mm -hmm. My question is... We don't know that for sure. No. no, okay, I would like then, in that case, my question is very simple. I'd like a commitment from the leader of the Labour group and the SNP group that they will not pursue this any further after the election. Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, I think this has been a very worthwhile uh, uh, exercise entirely. We hear a lot about community engagement, and this uh, has been active community engagement in action. We've consulted with the public and taken note of their responses. And certainly I'm aware of a number of points raised by constituents in the, the Clarkson area who cannot provide their own off-street off parking. It's just physically impossible. And I, I'm very pleased to see uh, that the leader has made an, an assurance that we will, for the first time, look at residence parking in Clarkson and, and other areas of pressure. And I think that's very long overdue and very welcome. Thank you, Councillor Lafferty. Councillor Miller. 
Thank you, Rob. <coughs> I'm glad to hear the Councillor Fletcher say that the money making exercise and just only that. And Councillor Lafferty just said that, um, that for the first time we're, we're listening to residents. Uh, <coughs> but I think at, at the last council meeting, I think you guys thought I was making things up as I went along to, to produce the, the amendment. But if you bother to, to go to the open date at Clarkson Hall and read the report in the Clarkson Charette, you see that it's exactly what the respondents asked for. All we were doing is putting forward an amendment that was giving local residents a voice. The, your, your consultation uh, was, was reje firmly rejected, uh, and it's only the consultation you put forward, only the wording you put forward, the, our wording has never been rejected. Can we approve the record? Yes, Thanks, Provost. Just to come in and uh, maybe clear up uh, a couple of points. When the, consulta the consultation went out, there were two parts to that consultation uh, of the draft order. The first was uh, about the proposal to introduce parking charges, and the second was um, the proposal to introduce or amend controlling regulations. Uh, the consultation had closed on the 2nd of December, and at that point we had 400 representations uh, along regarding the introduction of charges and a petition with over 1,500 signatures and a survey received from Broomburn shop workers as was alluded to, uh, stating many comments uh, that were taken on board. Following that, pulling all of that information together, the actual paper as it states in the paper that went to Cabinet, and the paper that is with us today, states quite clearly that the Council do not proceed with the introduction of off-street parking charges, and that the Director of Environment brings forward a report to the Council to make only the controlling regulations. That is what we're discussing. We've had a consultation, we've looked at the feedback, we've listened to what people have told us. We are aware of the other issues that, regarding residence parking, regarding uh, whether we look at various other amendments. That has all been taken on board. We have produced a paper, brought it to Cabinet, which Cabinet approved, and we're asking for, for approval today. The instruction, I think, is quite clear in that respect. Thank you. Can we approve the recommendations? Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, the Treasury Management Strategy Report, um, it's suddenly become quite a, a colourful document, uh, mentioning, as it does, the name Trump five times. Um, quite an interesting part, uh, and it was on page 56, in which it says, There is by no means any certainty that the politicians and advisors Trump has been appointing to his team will implement the more extreme policies he outlined during his election campaign. Indeed, Trump may even rein back on some of those policies himself. That was written just a few days before. Uh, anyway, moving on, as far as uh, the report is concerned, um, I'm happy to say that uh, exposure to variable rate, it is restricted to 30% of total borrowings. Uh, the older borrowings that were inherited from the Strathclyde region, days of between 9 and 10%, uh, they are now coming to an end. But I think more importantly than anything, uh, we are not committed to any investment or any consequent borrowing from that beyond a 12-month period, which means that if the economical forecast should dramatically change, we are in a position to modify them. Um, this, together with all prudential indicator targets being met, uh, the Audit and Scrutiny Committee uh, had indeed considered the content of the Treasury Management Report and recommend it be approved in full together with approval of the policy on the repayment of loan fund advances. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Wallace. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor McCaskill. I'm obliged, Provost. I would refer the Council to page 41, uh, paragraph 5.5, .5, subparagraph C, and the second sentence. I can read it out, Provost, if in case people haven't been quite caught up in it. Yeah. 
Under exceptional market conditions, the Chief Financial Officer may temporarily restrict further investment activity to those counterparties considered of higher credit quality than the minimum criteria set out in this strategy. Has the Chief Financial Officer seen anything, given recent decisions made in other places, that would change her decision on that? Thanks, Provost. Um, that part of the, the report is written in so that if we come across a situation such as we had back in 2007-2008 when uh, major banks were failing, that we would um, change our policy and make sure that we were extremely careful where we put the public money. Um, security is always, as you'll see in the report there, is always um, foremost in our considerations rather than we always have security first in the consideration, then liquidity, and then yield. So um, we would always take account of the best market information that we have. At the moment, um, there are no qualms about investing in the counterparties that are listed as above the minimum criteria. But if it would really be exceptional circumstances, we would um, always act to safeguard our assets. I'm obliged, Provost. Thank you, Provost. Uh, page 53, Annex C, first paragraph. I would like to welcome and note the comments from our experts that the UK is amongst the leading economies in the uh, developed world in terms of economic growth. And I would also like to welcome that uh, we are as part of the United Kingdom, doing so very well. However, unfortunately, local circumstances would suggest that Scotland is faring somewhat less well, and economic policies from the Scottish Government would appear to make that potentially even worse. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Can we approve the report? No questions or comments. Can we approve the plan? Or Page 79, paragraph 35. We have a particular concern that there is a limited private sector for providing nursery accommodation. Uh, I wonder uh, what the Council is proposing to do given that we need another 10 nurseries to uh, comply with Scottish Government legislation. Mrs Shaw, would you? Thank you, Provost. We, we are, of course, at present building on those plans. You'll remember the child care strategy that came to Education Committee a few months back. Um, we still await uh, and, and are looking for further financial support from the Scottish Government rather than just the 17-18 settlement that we have at the moment and look forward and I think have good news to that. Uh, or expect good news in, in that respect. But essentially, our strategy, there will be a, a mixed um, tenure almost, where we will use uh, local authority and we will need to build and, and expand our own estates. We will be relying on our private and voluntary providers and indeed childminders. So um, it will come forward. Probably in the autumn, there's an expectation that all local authorities will have plans, and uh, we'll look forward to bringing that to elected members at that time. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Provost. 
Councillor so, O'Kane, okay. thank you. Just to add to that, perhaps the Councillor Swift um, attended the Education Committee more regularly, he would know that, and he would know that Mrs Collins presented very detailed plans uh, on what the Council is doing to actually uh, meet the gap. Can we approve the plan? Item 10, Reserves Policy. This item submits for consideration a proposed reserve policy for the Council. Are there any questions or comments? Can we approve the policy? Yes. Item 12, East Renfrewshire Council Revenue Estimates... Oh, item 11, sorry. <laughs> Uh, East Renfrewshire Council Revenue Estimates 2017-18. We have before us this morning the proposal proposed revenue estimates for the Council for 2017-18. Related to this item is a supplementary report on late amendments to the local government settlement as issued separately. In terms of Standing Orders 1, I am seeking your consent to allow members to ex exceed their time limits on speeches. Is this agreed? I would now like to invite Councillor, Fle Leader, the Le Councillor Fletcher, Leader of the Council, to comment on the report. Yes, Councillor Robertson. As we were handed in, the sh past the sheets on as we come in the door to here, I've had absolutely no time to read the amendments from either side. And I don't feel it's appropriate to pass the entire council's budget for the forthcoming year without having a recess and been allowed to see what these exact amendments mean. So I would ask for a recess for 15 minutes. Have you got a set, a, a, an adjournment? Have you got a second for your adjournment? I'll put it to the vote then. Thank you, Travis. There, there is a motion that the, the Council adjourn for 15 minutes to allow the, the papers that have been tabled to be considered. Uh, that was proposed by Councillor Robertson, seconded by Councillor Wallace. So the vote will be against a motion to adjourn or not to adjourn. So those agreeing to adjournment, please show. Those agreeing not to adjourn, please show. Thank you, Provost. That's 12 for the motion, uh, I beg your pardon, 7 for the motion to adjourn, 12 for the amendment not to adjourn. The meeting will just continue. Thank you. I would now like to invite Council Fletcher to comment and report. Thank you very much, Provost, and good morning, colleagues. I'm sure members will be aware that just last week, there was a significant late amendment to the local government settlement for 2017-18, uh, which was published by the Scottish Government. The budget process for 2017-18 was already at a very advanced stage when the announcement was made, and council papers with their original proposals were published last Friday in advance of today's budget setting meeting. The administration group have worked rapidly to review these proposals in the light of the additional grant funding to see where we can further ease the pressure on our residents and apply this money to the best effect for them. Therefore, the budget that I will move today will be an amendment to that published in the Council papers. A copy of the amendment has been distributed to everyone and I will now, in my speech, highlight the key points. This year, even including the late amendment to the local government settlement, we have once again seen a cash reduction in the grant we receive from the Scottish Government when considered on a like-for-like -like basis. As an administration, we have worked extremely hard to bring forward a budget to you today which seeks to protect frontline services and utilise our finances to get the best return for our residents. The pressures on our services are greater than we have ever seen. But we have a rapidly growing elderly population with complex health and social care needs and one of the highest populations of young families in Scotland and they all require 
major investment. We are able to deliver a balanced budget against the backdrop only because of the very sound and long-term financial planning that we have undertaken over many years. We have also been careful to ensure that the measures we take to balance the books must also put us in a sound financial footing for future years. We are very aware that the recently announced change to council budgets may only be for one year, and therefore we must act prudently on our assumptions and not build up pressures for the future. Instead, we will use this budget to invest in areas that our residents tell us that are most important to them, and those which will have a long, which will have a long-term impact on our community. It gives me particular pleasure to confirm that once again, no compulsory redundancies will be required in delivering this year's budget, although as we continue to redesign our services to make them as efficient as possible, their staff will need to work with us flexibly and be open to redeployment and training opportunities. We will also manage to stand by our important commitment to increase the living wage for our lowest paid workers to £8.45 pence per hour, and this will also apply to overtime and other allowances. This budget also sets out very clearly how we have been able to offset some of the financial pressure we face through the Council's drive to modernise and become more efficient, with particular focus on harnessing the power of digital and new technologies. I would like to thank my administration colleagues, our trade union partners, our staff and accountancy, and of course our corporate management team for their tireless work to help balance this budget in the face of unprecedented pressures so that we continue to protect our frontline services and protect the most vulnerable in our community. Taking into account last week's late settlement changes, the Scottish <coughs> Council will now receive a grant from the Scottish Government of £175.97 million, an increase of £2.5 million on revenue grant funding from the initial announcement in December. I also very much welcome this announcement that is still a significant cash reduction when compared on a like-for-like -like basis with the current year. I also welcome the announcement from the Scottish Government that councils can retain the income resulting from the decision of the Scottish Parliament to raise council tax charges for bands E to H. This ensures that the link between local taxation and local services is maintained. For East Renfrewshire Council, this amounts to an income of £4.1 million. Overall, therefore, the funds available to us on a like-for-like -like basis are very similar to those available last year. However, this does not take account of inflation or the increased demands facing the Council, especially in terms of increasing numbers of young children and older people. Until last week's announcement, we were facing a 2017-18 savings gap of £9.7 million. Pounds. However, the new settlement goes some way to easing the severe financial pressure we are under and has reduced our savings gap for 2017-18 to £7.2 million. Pounds. However, please be clear that the savings gap took no account of the areas that our residents tell us that they want prioritised and gave us no opportunity to invest in the services that are so needed by our most vulnerable residents. Closing the gap merely balanced the books. I don't imagine any of the councillors from whatever political party or none that are sitting here today want to just balance the books. I'm sure we all come into politics to make a difference and to improve services in our area. Back in 2015, we set out a very prudent and long-term financial plan which would see us deliver savings of some £22 million over the three financial years 2015 to 2018. In our published papers to efficiency measures, and plans via a modernisation programme and other savings, we have identified £7.7 million worth of savings. 
However, in light of the late budget announcement, I propose to defer some of the most challenging savings impacting directly on schools' budgets until 2018-19. This will allow our education department more time to prepare for these savings, which regrettably we know um, will almost certainly have to be taken next year due to the ongoing savings challenges that we face. Furthermore, I propose that an additional one-off payment is made to the IGIB to part compensate for the savings planned from the transfer of Bonneton House to the private sector. This will allow the IGIB more time to find a new purchaser. If this money had not been made available to the IGIB, it would have been hard, it would have been, the IGIB would have had to have found savings to compensate for those expected from the sale of Bonneton, and these would have undoubtedly led to reduced services to our most vulnerable residents and could have resulted up to 20 job losses. Thus, the decision to sell Bonneton was taken with a very heavy heart. I believe it was in the best interest of the taxpayers of East Renfrewshire Council, and it would also protect the residents within Bonneton House and protect the jobs of the staff who work in Bonneton House. We already have a very strong proven track record for achieving significant savings through being more efficient and redesigning services so that not only are they more cost effective, but they also deliver better benefits for our residents. The pace and scale of the change which is underway across the Council is something as an administration that we are very proud of. We now have more than 500 staff working in an agile way, supported by new technology, and this number is growing all the time. The modernisation and transformation of services is evident throughout every corner of our council through our flagship modern ambitious programme. Of the total savings that we have had to make from council budgets, more than 70%, or £3.9 million, pounds, has been achieved, achieved through being more efficient at what we do to protect frontline services from cuts as far as possible. We have continued to redesign services, streamline processes and taken a more modern approach to our business functions to realise these benefits. Some of these projects include the introduction of a new and very successful curbside refuse and recycling collection arrangements. By moving to this new system, we will save £300,000 for financial year 2017-18, and this has also future-proofed this service to help us meet tough new recycling targets which have been set by the Scottish Government. More than £300,000 will be saved for the financial year 2017-18, and £1.3 million over the past three years in reviewing management, admin and clerical services right across the Council. We now have a more modern, streamlined and efficient processes in place that have at the same time delivered on our promise of no compulsory redundancies. In 2017-18, we'll also see our education department save more than £100,000 by reviewing and adjusting staffing levels in our early learning and childcare facilities in line with actual numbers of children who use the service. This will make sure that we are not overstaffing at times when occupancy is lower. Also, because we have developed some of the highest quality in-house services for children with additional support needs here in East Renfrewshire, we have been able to save some £220,000 by no longer having to buy in this provision from an external source. We are also totally focused on getting the best possible value for the public purse by vigorously negotiating contracts with suppliers to get the best deals. In 2018, for example, we will save more than £160,000 on a new mobile phone contract alone. In fact, over the next three years of this budget, more than £800,000 has been saved by innovative new ways of procuring services. I think you'll agree that this continued and determined focus on efficiency 
uh, to offset the need for service cuts is paying real dividends for the Council. When setting this year's budget, Administration Councillors have acknowledged that the financial challenges we will face will continue to grow in future years and it will become increasingly difficult to find new investment. We have already had to take some very tough decisions to find savings, whilst at the same time try to maintain services for the most vulnerable in our community. We know from our long-term planning that, if anything, the situation will worsen in the coming years and we will be faced with increased savings requirements and reduced opportunities to invest in vital services. Regrettably, therefore, the only way to prepare for the future years and protect against cuts to the services is to raise council tax by 3% across all bands, which will generate £1.5 million in each rentership. This is the first rise in council tax for a decade, and whilst it has been a very di difficult decision for the administration councillors to take, it is the most prudent decision to put the council in a more solid financial footing for future years when we will know the financial challenges facing us will be even greater than they are now. It will allow us to invest this year now in vital services which will reduce the impact on budgets in future years. The 3% increase is separate from the council tax changes for bands E to H which have already been set by the Scottish Government. It is also important to note that residents themselves have told us that they would rather pay more for council tax uh, in their council tax to fund improvements to services and avoid further cuts. Furthermore, our trade union partners have also advised us that they too would rather see an increase in council tax as opposed to further cuts in essential services or jobs. In addition, our current level of reserves are at the upper end of recommended levels at 4% of net revenue expenditure. Given the difficulties forecast going forward, the administration agreed to use some of these funds to ease the pressure on our residents with some key investments in the services that we know our residents value most. By making these investments now, when we have a good level of reserves in place, we will be able to future-proof a number of important services by putting them on a more solid footing. These plans were in our original proposals, which were published last week. However, the late settlement changes now mean that we can add to the level of investment that we originally planned. I'm absolutely delighted, therefore, to announce a package of investment worth £4.1 million pounds for a range of key improvement projects and core services which have been designed to make a real difference to our residents and tackle some of the issues that matter most to them. The feedback from a recent citizens panel survey revealed that the level of satisfaction our residents have with the services is at its highest level in over a decade. Residents also told us that they rate the quality of life at the highest level for five years. However, equally importantly, it also revealed some of the key issues that matter most to our residents. For the first time since we began the survey, almost 20 years ago now, roads was identified by our residents as a top priority for East Refusher Council. Whilst another theme that came through included access to affordable early learning and childcare. Therefore, a £4.1 million package sees investment in our assets and in projects for the youngest and most vulnerable in our society. We will invest more than £2.4 million in key environmental projects and these will include an extra £1.6 million for improvements in local roads and footpaths. We know that the condition of our roads is a really important issue for our residents and despite investing around £4.2 million every year to maintain our roads, there is still more to be done, especially in local residential roads and streets as opposed to the main trunk roads which tend to get priority at present. 
This additional £1.6 million pounds will therefore be targeted specifically at local roads and also in ageing footpaths right across the East Renfrewshire Council area to help ease some of the issues that our residents are currently experiencing. We will also invest a further £84,000 in our improvements to our town and village centres. To support our wider roads improvements, we have also ring fenced further funds to ensure road and pavement improvements in our town and village centres to support ongoing regeneration and our commitment to making these areas as vibrant as possible. We will also be investing in renewing and restoring damaged and ageing paved areas and steps throughout the authority. An extra £755,000 will also be invested in a broad range of wider environmental improvements. This package will include a major improvement to Curran Park, creating a new play park and enhancements to the War Memorial. We will also deliver improvements to the Kingston playing fields in Milston and a play park is also planned. Improvements to mixed tenure housing sites are also planned such as renovating shared closes together with other changes which will create the space needed for flatted properties in the areas um, to benefit from a new curbside recycling scheme. We are also going to, to be targeting our local recycling bring sites to make them more attractive by investing in improved screening and fencing. The money will also see the introduction of a cycle hire scheme in Newton Glen Park, plus road safety projects and a programme of tree works in parks and public areas. In our education service, we will be investing a further £1.1 million on important projects, including 645000 to put East Renfrewshire Council schools at the forefront of digital learning. The Centre Council has always been at the forefront of education in Scotland and we are already at an advanced stage in rolling out our plans for digital classrooms. The core of this programme is the Bring Your Own Device scheme which allows pupils to bring their own tablets and laptops to school for continuity of device between school and home. <coughs> the scheme has many benefits including inspiring new ways of learning and teaching. We are, however, acutely aware that not all of our residents can afford to provide their children with their own device. We will therefore provide more than 1,250 East Renfrewshire school children who are from the less affluent households in our area with a tablet so that all our pupils can benefit from digital learning. We also want to harness the power of virtual reality and 3D technology for all our pupils a recent tested experience in some of our schools used virtual reality headsets to expose our pupils to entirely new experiences and transported them on virtual reality school trips across the universe, for example, plunging into the depths of the Pacific Ocean and then relating those experiences to learning in geography and biology. This kind of immersive technology can provide our children with experiences and sensations that they may never experience and brings learning uh, to life in a way that ignites their imagination. The use of such technology will broaden their horizons to such a degree that we have decided to invest in a class set of devices for each and every one of our primary and secondary schools so that virtual reality and 3D learning becomes an embedded part of teaching uh, for all our pupils. We are the first council in Scotland to invest in such technology and together with your Bring Your Own Device scheme, there is no doubt that we will be at the very forefront of digital learning in our country. The unique digital experiences of pupils will be second to none. We will also invest £150,000 to slash the cost of wraparound care in our nurseries by 50%. We fully recognise that the increases in council tax will impact on our residents and one of the biggest areas where we think we can help ease some of the pressures is on the cost 
of additional time in our nurseries. We want our residents to be able to better afford high quality childcare so that they can have the flexibility they need to go to work. We are reducing wraparound care by more than 50% from £4.60 per hour to £2.25 per hour. This will save some parents over £1,200 per annum. This price change will be permanent and it will enable working families to better plan their finances and childcare arrangements going forward. A further £107,000 will be invested to create an early years pupil equity fund. This fund will be available for a full year to support early years establishments with interventions that will lead to improvements in literacy, numeracy and health and well-being. The focus will be in prevention through building staff capacity to work with children and families and developing staff skills. The aim of this fund is to prevent problems before they arise and intervene earlier to reduce the impact of poverty on learning. Furthermore, we will be committing £200,000 for significant enhancements to outdoor learning landscapes. These funds have been specifically earmarked to further equip our schools and early years facilities with, with improved outdoor equipment and facilities to promote creativity, physical activity, play and self-confidence. In addition, the measures I, I have already in addition, the measures I have already outlined, we will also be investing fifty thousand pounds for a reading recovery scheme in our primary schools. This important scheme will allow further er early intervention for children in our primary schools who are having difficulty with reading. Creating employment and training opportunities for young people is also a key priority for this administration and we have pledged some £173,000 to help create even more opportunities for them which will include £73,000 to support or look after young people gain access to employment. As part of our important corporate parenting programme which is in place to support looked after young people in East Renfrewshire, we have developed a very ambitious project to help them gain access to employment. The project known as Family Firm identifies work placement and skills opportunities within the council and with our external partners. This important additional investment will allow us to further enhance the programme and ensure that Family Firm continues to support this group of young people to fulfil their full potential. We will also invest £100,000 for graduate trainee places. This funding will allow us to create additional placement and work opportunities for young graduates and trainees in an exciting programme of change and modernisation with a key focus on digital and data roles. Some £110,000 has also been committed for a number of specific schemes to help some of the most vulnerable in our community and these include £100,000 for AIDS and adaptations. With a rapidly growing ageing population, we have developed a range of the very highest quality services in Scotland designed to help and support the residents stay in their homes for longer and lead their lives with as much independence and dignity as possible. One of the key ways in which we are helping people to stay at home is by helping to adapt their homes to allow for issues such as reduced mobility. We provide a range of aids and adaptations in the home from personal alarms and simple handrails right across to wet rooms which are suitable for wheelchairs. These services are changing lives and to support them, uh, we uh, to do even more to help some of the most vulnerable in our community. I'm very pleased to pledge a further £100,000 for even more of these aids and adaptations. Our investment plans also include £10,000 to further increase the number of disability friendly taxis in East Renfrewshire. We know our residents want to help to get more wheelchair accessible taxis on our East Renfrewshire roads and this money will be used to help encourage taxi drivers 
to take up these vehicles. As part of our package of investments, we have also committed a further £150,000 to leisure facilities through the East Renfrewshire Culture and Leisure Trust. This will fund additional schemes including extra resources and books for our libraries, new mobile theatre equipment for shows being performed in our community halls, new technology to allow, to allow live streaming at Eastwood Park Theatre, and extra gym and fitness equipment for both the Barhead Boundary and the Eastwood Park Leisure Complex. And in a, a further boost, £100,000 has been pledged to support the ongoing regeneration of Binterley and Dockin Black. This will see the creation of a community worker post to support key projects and involve the local community in decisions in spending and how the, the work is taken forward. It will also allow improvements in the Binterley Resource Centre. In addition to the one-off investments for 2017-18 that I've just outlined, we are also committed to a major capital investment programme of more than £131 million over the next eight years, which will drive growth, support the delivery of new schools, ensure our exciting city deal plans are delivered and create new opportunities. Some of the key projects over the next eight years are highlighted for you on the screen. They include completion of the new Barhead High School at a cost of £30.8 million, pounds, construction of a new railway station for Barhead South at a cost of £11.5 million, pounds, investment in Eastwood Park Leisure and Theatre Complex £6 million, pounds, Dams to Darnley Country Park Visitor Centre and Infrastructure at £4.8 million, pounds, a new Maiden Hill Primary School and Nursery at a cost of £14.7 million, pounds. completion of the world's first faith school joint campus at a cost of £17.5 million, pounds. and replacement of Arthur Lay Family Centre with a new community hub in Auchenbach at a cost of £5.3 million. Pounds. Last but not least, upgrade of Barhead Foundry Pool and Gym at a cost of £1.9 million. Pounds. In summation, balancing our budget this year has not been an easy task, but we have used a range of measures to address the savings gap and to protect frontline services as far as is possible going into the future. We have brought forward ambitious plans to invest in key services that matter most to our residents and to get the best result for them. This has been made possible by drawing in reserve funding which has been built up thanks to the prudent long-term financial planning and through the additional one-off monies which are made available to us through the late settlement. We believe these investments will make a difference and ease pressure on the people we serve and that these and the first council tax increase for a decade will establish a better foundation from which we can meet the challenges that will face the council in future years. We know that in future the financial challenges facing us will continue to grow. We will need to continue to steer a course which delicately balances the protection of services and jobs with ever increasing grant cuts from Scottish Government. In recent years, Scottish Government settlement announcements have only been for the year ahead, which makes it very difficult to take long term financial planning decisions. We therefore call and Scottish Government to provide longer term settlements in future years so that we can plan as effectively as possible the challenges that lie ahead. Once again, can I thank everyone who has been involved in this lengthy and difficult budget process and can I ask the Council this morning to approve the revenue estimates for 2017-18 approve the recommended level and utilisation of reserves and determine the Council tax band D level for 2017-18 at £1,159.78 and note that the management of the Council's finances and service plans will continue to be undertaken on a longer term basis. Thank you.
Thank you, Provost. I'm um, delighted uh, to second Councillor Fletcher's motion and commend the revenue estimates to the Council. College administration from the outset has been totally focused on ensuring the long-term financial stability of East Renfrewshire Council. The fact that today's budget commits some £4.1 million in improvements to vital services is a testament to the long-term and prudent financial planning approach. We would not be in this position today of being able to make such a commitment had we not been working hard for many years to manage the Council's finances in the best way possible. To offset the impact of the financial pressures on us, we have embarked on a hugely ambitious programme to modernise and be as efficient as possible. It is no small feat, colleagues, that some 4.4 million of the savings to Council budgets have come not from cuts but from being more efficient in what we do. Millions of pounds are being saved thanks to leaner processes, more streamlined systems and through harnessing new technologies. I recognise absolutely that the council and the rising council tax will impact on our residents. However, it is important to stress that we offer the very best education for our children year on year, the highest quality of health and social care for our most vulnerable, and again, we are highly commended for the services that we deliver, and we're one of the first IGBs to be set up to deliver those new services. We also offer fantastic local amenities and green space, including the UK's best part, to mention just a few. On top of this, residents will also benefit from our exciting programme of investment, which will enhance our local roads and footpaths network, something which is very much needed, and we are told that on a regular basis by our residents, so we're putting significant investment into that, put our schools at the very forefront of digital learning in Scotland and slash the cost of wraparound care in half for our nurseries and to help families get back to work. Add this to an additional programme of capital investment worth more than £131 million in a range of bold infrastructure projects to drive growth and create employment opportunities and I believe that we can demonstrate the real value for money to our residents and a return on their investment in us. We are investing wisely for the future in the services which matter most to our residents. I am also very proud of the measures we have taken to ease pressure on our staff by increasing the living wage and confirming that once again no compulsory redundancies will be required in this financial year. I would like to thank all of those who have been involved throughout this process, very long and very difficult process. Today we have announced a budget to ensure greater stability in future years, and it is a budget that I support fully. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Buchanan. <coughs> Councillor Miller, do you wish to move an amendment? That's very kind of you, Provost. Uh, once again, this year, similar to last, can I begin by acknowledging my sincere thanks to Lorraine McMillan and Margaret McCrossan for, and the directors for all their help and advice that we've received over the past few weeks. Can I also acknowledge that the Budget Strategy Group, directors and heads of service have not done an easy task in identifying further cuts to the Council budget and can I also acknowledge that they have done a sterling job over the past several years in identifying millions of pounds worth of cuts that most local people haven't really noticed a difference. And in most of the cuts and savings identified this year, I would suggest there will be some who will not notice a difference, but for most, Council services will be there again as normal. But once again, I'm not going to challenge any of the proposals in the original papers that we had, but my amendment is merely to enhance the administration's proposals. Over the past few years, this council has lost one member of the CMT every two or three years, and it gives me no pleasure to suggest that perhaps this time, when the time has come, that we have to reduce the CMT by another member. I remember a few years ago when Noddy Wilkinson re retired, I was shocked that this administration decided not to replace the Director of Finance, but Margaret has filled in it excellently, and the council has carried on seamlessly. But the administration was proved correct at that time, so perhaps this needs to be looked at again. 
Last year I proposed cutting several posts in various departments, but this year I'm not proposing to cut any other than the one I've just described, but I'm proposing a recruitment freeze for just one year. I was advised that this could bring a saving of about 250000 but there will be a couple of essential posts obviously needing filled, so I've proposed a saving of only 200000 I'm told that every year we have a better than forecast collection rate of council tax, which usually brings in about 97.5 per cent, although there are times when this is over 98 per cent. And this is where the extra money goes that we've been able to build up our reserves over the past few years. I'm proposing we try to achieve the 98 per cent or above, and this will bring well over a million pounds, so I've put down a modest 1.1 million, as this is the average of the figures achieved over the past eight years. We do not pull these figures out of thin air as these are the Council's own figures. We do it every other year and it's not been budgeted, so let us do it this year and budget for it. It's also time to copy other Council's ways of bringing in revenue, and I make no apology for blagging other Council's ideas of selling advertising space and bin lorries, Council buildings, etc. Advertising does work. As a friend of mine purchased advertising space in a local church leaflet within a week, he had three new jobs that he would not have got otherwise. If he can do that with a very localised magazine in just one week, then how much could we earn from selling space? And I use the bin lorries as a prime example, as these vehicles already have space for adverts on the side where they are frequently advertised council services, so it would cost nothing to get the, this initiative started. Perhaps we now have to think out of the box with several new and innovative ideas to bring in revenue and save having to make cuts in future years. I think putting a figure of 100,000 is a very modest start in year one, which could be expanded in future years. The investments I've got are obviously, when I was writing this speech, I didn't know what the administration were going to do with the 2.546 million that's unexpectedly been forced out of the Hollywood oh. government. But my proposal is to give it straight back to the people from which it has been taken. Last year, you may recall, I proposed a, a, a saving on managing absence, as we are the second worst council in Scotland for absence. One year on, it's not much better, but the, the, after the verbal assault we got last year for even suggesting an improvement, perhaps the administration happily accepts this has been one of the worst councils for absence. I'm delighted to see that you guys have taken that advice from last year and are putting an extra million increase to 1.6 million uh, that we heard about. 10 minutes ago, um, into the Cumbering Road network, network. I think that every year my predecessor have proposed extra investment in our roads, and almost every year it would be knocked back. If you are, has, has, as has been claimed, a listening council, we have heard that several times this morning, residents all over the council, thank you, residents all over the, 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 the sorry, if, if you are the new that listening council residents all over the council area will have told you that we need to do something about our roads. So please listen to residents and act on it. I have tremendous admiration for Mr. Cahill and his team for doing the best they can with diminishing resources. So from the savings I have already identified and unexpected money stood out of the government, let's give the residents what they want for a change. So I'm proposing to give the roads department a further one million over and above what was there originally. It's another 400,000 what's now proposed, and tried to make a real improvement. After all, how can you expect continued inward investment from out with our area if our own infrastructure is not right? This way, perhaps we can climb the roads department's lead table and get at least get into the top half. I'm also delighted to see that you're proposing to put local mon uh, more money into local recycling points, and again, local people use these facilities. I'm proposing to double the investment you've got from 15 to 30,000. These are the things that local residents would like to see, so really try, try to help them where they can. Finally, I don't know about other councillors, but my inbox has been little else over the last few weeks, but complaints about the SNP's premium and council tax. As I'm sure most of us will know, more than 50% of our East Renshaw <laughs> households are within bands E2H, and every one of them are going to get hammered by the nationalist proposal and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. So I'm proposing a cut of 6% in the council tax across all bands A to H. We've heard many stories about cuts, but this is the only time we've had a cut in council tax, as it will help everyone in our area, not only the bands to ETH, but also the poorest in our society. 
This is what residents have been telling us, and I'm sure you're no different. So let's try and help the residents and not try to fleece them at every turn. This council, as with all councils, have had to make cuts across the whole spectrum of council services, and the only thing we haven't cut is council tax. With the above investments, <coughs> excuse me, we return almost all of the money back to residents, either in their pockets or in services that which they have indicated they want. <coughs> Can I recommend that you accept my very modest amendment and prove that you are listening to residents? It's all very well you're tell telling people you're listening, but it's quite another actually doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Do, do you have a seconder? Thank you, Provost. Councillor Fletcher says we are prioritising what matters most to residents. Returning people's money to them absolutely ensures that they can prioritise what matters most to them. Councillor Buchanan advised the Council has managed to make substantial efficiencies without making cuts and without people noticing. We welcome that all too late, Labour and the SNP have recognised that the Council could save millions by smarter working. Well done, a bit late, but better late than never. Britain has, as we have seen and heard, the fastest growing economy in the developed world. However, that is because, let's be honest, nowhere is really growing very quickly. Our Labour and SNP colleagues constantly say that people are struggling. And we agree. I find it hard to reconcile that taking more of struggling people's money is going to help them. An, anal an analogy that might be useful is to describe that taking food from hungry people will help them. Well, I don't think it would. Cutting council tax, and we are proposing to do just that for the people in the lower bands of housing, will help them. And that would be good news for them. In East Renfrewshire, we have the highest percentage of people over 75 in Scotland. This is a cause for celebration, and we also all recognise that that does put a significant strain on local services, and managing the balance is difficult. If you may indulge me, I'm going to read just two sentences from an email I got from one of my constituents. The council, act in, the council tax increase my wife and I face is 17.5% and the council has discretion and can raise it by another 3%. My pension is of course fixed. I am faced with four options. We can eat into our ever diminishing savings, we can sell our home, we can refuse to pay or we can kill ourselves. How would you suggest we proceed? We have not only a very high proportion of older people, but people on fixed incomes who can ill afford such increases. Increasing taxes, as we all know, acts as a break on growth, encourages adverse changes in people's behaviour that causes negative economic consequences and discourages economic activity. We suggest that giving back to local people much of what was taken from them by the SNP in Holyrood, and I would like to remind people here, supported by Labour there, can, I think, only be described as the only humane policy. Councillor Fletcher mentioned Bonneton, and, and in their amendment that is encouraging to note that they want to spend money, but I think it was fair to suggest that earlier, and we have debated this, and I'm not going to go over it, the combined plan by residents, staff, and the Conservatives showed how you could save that money. I would urge you, rather than spending money, to take the steps that everybody has agreed would actually help the Bonneton Care Home become a sustainable, financially viable venture. So I'm going to finish with, with one thought. If we care about the mental health of our older residents on fixed incomes, we should return some of the money that we propose to take from them and the Scottish Government proposes to take from them with Labour support. And rather than funding wraparound care subsidies, why not give the money back to the people so that they can choose how to spend their own money. That might be a kind of healthier thing to do for everyone concerned. Be finished. Thank you, Councillor Sir. I now, I now open it up to other members, but I would ask you, if I have lifted standing orders regarding the length of time to speak, I would ask you all to try and keep your speeches short. Councillor Robertson first. Thank you. 
uh, Council Swift obviously listens to completely different residents that I speak to. The majority actually welcome a council tax rise. The part that they don't welcome is the bands E to H and then they get an additional rise over and above that, but they would like to contribute more money to keep the services that are valued to them. I don't actually see much in the budget amendment from the Conservatives as it wipes out the administration amendment, which has considerable things in it that will be to the benefit of residents. One bit that seriously worries me is a review of Bonneton. It was never mentioned a review of Bonneton to actually keep it in council ownership. It was a review of Bonneton to get a, uh, another seller. Why are we not trying to learn from the private sector? If they can run a care home profitable, are we giving up that we are worse? I cannot believe it. I've not met one resident that wants bonnet and put into the private sector. It will not protect salaries and conditions, as you say. It will for a very limited period, possibly three years. Pension provisional change. We're not doing a service to residents or staff there. The, unfortunately, as you wouldn't give me a break for 15 minutes to be able to read everything over, I have taken in most and like a lot of the things, and I'll probably not comment much more because I'll read it while the rest of the people are talking. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Provis. It has uh, been an interesting debate thus far because I think it underlines the major rift between ourselves and the opposition. On the one hand, uh, an administration that's committed to invest in public services to meet the needs of our residents as opposed to an opposition whose prime concern is to reduce taxation. That certainly reflects central government policy where uh, public service funding is not determined by economics, it's determined by politics. Politics that are going to take the UK towards a low tax, low wage service economy. As someone who has worked in industry, I regret the shrinking of our manufacturing at, through a lack of investment. I think we can do a lot better. Now regarding Bonneton, Bonneton has been a, a hard press matter. But the facts remain. Under the current costs of financial pressures in the coming financial year for Bonneton are between £636,000 and £703,000, depending on the mix of self-funded residents and council-funded residents. If we didn't have additional funding from the council as proposed by the administration, plus some extra funding as a result of the government for formula for IGB funding, we would require to make savings equivalent if we did nothing at Bonneton, of disposing of 17 newly qualified social workers or 83 home care packages is the cost of being able to deliver 28 residential places under our own ownership. As opposed to a market which is out there, and I have to say, when I joined, when I went into social work, we didn't have a market for elderly care. We had a public service model. That has been changed by subsequent Conservative governments. We have a market now. And there are spaces out there in the, in the independent and private sector to accommodate all our residential needs. You look at the planning application papers, you see new applications for further uh, elderly residential accommodation in the area. We have a duty towards our elderly residents, but we also have a duty of stewardship of the public pound. I've come in, as long as I've been on the council, I've emphasised I'm in favour of investing public money in providing services, but they don't have to be within our ownership. <coughs> as I say, they don't have to be within our ownership. If it's, more cost, if it's better value for money, cost effective, then we have to deliver that service at a reasonable rate. And I certainly am pleased to see 
that we can keep Bonnet at, that the, the administration is providing the fun funding to the IGB to maintain Bonnet in over the next year to allow us to see if we can find another bidder. Currently there are no bidders for Bonneton. The choice, if we cannot find another bidder, then we have a difficult choice to make. And I have to say that already my NHS colleagues, some of my NHS colleagues on the IGB board are asking that we include looking at closure as a possible option, which is something none of us would wish to do, but we have a duty. Uh, as I say, partnership, the council is only half the partnership. The other part half is NHS colleagues, who I know this year have already voted to close a hospital. They're looking to remove community midwife care from the Vale of Leaven in Inverclyde and take away paediatric services from Ward 15 at the RAH. So they don't really have a lot of sympathy, I'm afraid, for our sensibilities. Particularly as I think in future years, unless additional funding is found for the NHS from the government in Westminster to Holyrood and to the, the health boards in Scotland, I think we're facing the closure of the, whoever is on the health board over the next few years I have to contemplate the closure of another two hospitals. That is the difficult choices we face. Thank you, Councillor Lafferty. Anyone else want to come in? Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, just very interesting listening to some of the rhetoric that's coming out here. We've got the, the Leader of the Council um, to quote uh, concerns about severe financial pressure we, the Council, are under. We have the Deputy Leader uh, mentioning the words, uh, working hard to manage the Council's finances. We've even just had the Chair of the IJB mention about the stewardship of public funds. This is the same financial pressure or working hard to manage the Council's finances, etc., etc., that suddenly decides that we need to spend 110000 in a Council chamber for, what, half a dozen TV screens and a new carpet? We've got a new reception area out there, a perfectly functional before we changed it, but all of a sudden it's looking more like something more befitting of the heaps for Strictly Come Dancing. We, um, we've just had an amendment come through. We're talking about £4.1 million pounds worth of an amendment, and they will not even give 15 minutes to the opposition parties to consider these amendments. This is us who are representing a large number of people who are just becoming a little bit fed up with what this council is doing. I've mentioned two, um, two areas in which we've um, invested quite heavily. I understand we're also about to invest uh, quite a large sum of money on new desks upstairs. All I can tell you is that uh, you'll probably find that the, the owners of the small businesses who employ a huge number of people who all contribute towards the tax and this council would love to have the old ones. Moving on, I'm only mentioning a few things here. These are things we can see, but it is indicative of the mindset of this council that all we have to do is up the tax and take the income and spend it. Time has come that this has to stop. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Wallace. Is anyone else? Anything? Councillor? I'm obliged, Provost. Um, I have listened to the various people this morning and particularly the leader of the council who gave us a very positive message of the way they're going to be spending money in this council. The reality in Scotland is that the budget for Scotland has descended into utter chaos when we are told about budget amendments with less than a week's notice. And we have the deputy leader of the council talking about greater stability. How can we have greater stability when we don't know what we're getting at less than a week's notice? Just the reality is that council tax is going to go up by 3%. Council tax rebanding is shooting up. There are swinging increases in business rates and water rates are also going up. What we have in this country, and particularly in this council area, will amount to penal and usurious confiscations of people's hard-earned cash, or what could best be described as revenge taxation. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to me that the Conservative Amendment for a 6% reduction in council tax 
is simply taking account of the fact that people are going to get clobbered in the next few weeks and they're going to see nothing for it because, as the leader of the council is, we are still going to be facing huge cuts. So what we're seeing is huge increases and huge cuts at precisely the same time by a government in Scotland which budgetarily has descended into panic and chaos. As just one more thing regarding the administration amendments, which we were not allowed to have a 15-minute adjournment on, it should perhaps be pointed out, page 103, and a commitment to the East Renfrewshire Culture and Leisure Trust of money that is to be spent, 155000 on various things, can I perhaps point out to the Council that the Leisure Trust is an arm's length organisation. You give them the money, they decide how they spend it, not you. This is how disorganised you have become. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCaskill. Thank you, Robbie. I think just, just for clarity, it might be useful to remind uh, members that every year when the Conservative group presents an amendment, the Labour group, that's the first time the, the administration sees it. So we don't have time to consider your amendment. We, we go to the meeting and, and we respond to the amendment as and when. So the reality is um, this is a budget that will invest and protect the Mr. Emerson, and I support it today. Just turning to the Conservative amendment that's before us, just for clarity, reduction of one member of the corporate management team would be useful if the, the Conservative group would maybe explain to us what uh, remit they feel they should be getting rid of. Um, the reality is Mrs McCrossan rightly replaced Mr Williamson as the Chief Financial Officer because she has a Section 95 responsibility, which is a legal responsibility within that role. But it would be useful to know whether they think that Mr Cahill should be deleted from his post and that we should perhaps merge the, the massive environmental brief with education or, or health and social care, or whether you know, Mrs Shaw's post should be deleted and we should then merge education in with something else. The reality is we have over the years reduced the corporate management team quite substantially so that different remits now sit under various directors and middle management is streamlined. So uh, just for clarity, it would be useful to know that. And a second point of clarity would also be useful to know if the recruitment freeze they propose will extend to teaching staff. Because the reality is we have a requirement to meet teacher numbers in line with the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government sets us um, a, a limit we need to reach in terms of teacher numbers. So if we don't meet that, we're going to have grant clawed back. So if we're, if we're freezing recruitment within the council, well, that includes teachers. And just one further point on listening to local residents about roads. We, we have listened to local residents over many years, and today we commit to invest in 1.6 million in roads. The Conservative group said that year on year they've called for investment in roads. I seem to recall last year's budget amendment calling on the reduction of gritting routes. Now that suggests to me, no, I believe it did, and I have it in black and white, reduction of gritting routes, and people will remember this, it will be in the minute. The reality is, well, no, absolutely not, the reality is in black and white you said reduction of gritting routes. So that's not calling for investment in roads year on year. Thank you, Provost. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment who hasn't spoken already on this? No. Okay. Um, um, sorry? Councillor Fletcher, I now ask you to sum up. Uh, thank you very much, Provost. Uh, I think looking at the Conservative amendment sets out why the Conservatives could never be trusted to run this council. <laughs> it's just utterly, utterly bizarre. And, well, I think um, the, the people who would face the shock, I have to say, are the residents. And it's our job between now and May to actually expose the type of people who could run the council beyond May before they actually cast their vote. So I welcome, I welcome the Conservative amendment because it absolutely sets out the difference between us. I would say firstly, it is wholly irresponsible to go for a council tax reduction when you know we face such financial pressures over the coming years. I know you may think it's an easy fix and it's a popular fix, but it is wholly irresponsible. 
and I think deep down you all know that. I have to say in making, even attempting to make the figures work, it just seems to be figures plucked out of the air. As my colleague Councillor O'Kane said, get rid of a member of the CMT, you have very good directors, all very hard working directors, but you don't say who that unfortunate individual is who presumably is to be made redundant. Um, the council tax increase, um, you've got a figure of £1.1 million. Pounds. Do you honestly think we have people here not trying to maximise our council tax collection rates? They are the best in Scotland. There is no scope, but it's just simply nonsense to say we will increase it and put a figure of £1.1 million pounds in. And even some of the, the smaller comments that you have made, I would say in Bonneton, um, my colleague Councillor Lafferty very eloquently outlined um, the prospects in the future, and I would suggest that you perhaps look at the paper that will be published tomorrow, which will go to the IGIB and set out the financial position in Bonneton. And Councillor Robertson says, why can we not run that efficiently? Well, one of the main reasons in Bonneton is it's a very small unit. It's 28 um, potential beds in there. Um, most private companies um, have economies of scale. They run many care homes, and invariably, if you run a lot of care homes, you can run them much more efficiently than trying to run a small care home. I would lastly say, I don't know why Councillor uh, Wallace chose to uh, talk about a very small amount of money that's been spent in the reception area. I didn't seem to be on the amendment. Um, mindset. Well, I have to say, mindset, I think, is looking after the customers. We had a situation in the reception area which was cold for the staff who worked there because the sliding doors were never closing. You had young families coming in to register newly born babies who were left sitting in the freezing cold. Um, you had people coming in to discuss planning applications because there was nowhere to take them and they're sitting in the middle of reception with maps and their, their knees and whatever. There's a very modest amount of money to make life much better both for the people who work there but also for the people who have to come into the council for legitimate um, business. And I find that very odd that Conservative councillors um, seem to find that um, an unusual spend. In terms of our own spend and our accommodation, it's much less than most councils elsewhere, but there are sums of money that you do have to spend to allow people to work more efficiently. Um, this is an old building that was built in the early 70s, I believe. It's time expired. It needs investment, and the, the type of investment that you're seeing upstairs actually allows more people to work in the building, work more efficiently, and gives us savings overall. So I, I think I'm very happy to see the, the Conservative amendment set out in the fashion it is, because it does set out quite clearly the difference between our administration, who wish to invest in services, and we have a one-off opportunity to do that today, um, or against the Conservatives who will not invest in services and simply want to cut the council tax. And before we do go to the vote, I would remind you that our amendment stops the cuts in education this year. I hope when you all go to your parent councils and you discuss these cuts in the schools, if you're not going to support our amendment here today which stops the cuts, I hope you get the honesty to say to those parents and teachers that you speak with that I could have stopped the cuts, but I chose not to, because that's what you're doing here today. So... I'll leave it at that, and I would encourage all councillors to support the motion here today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. We will now go to the vote. Thank you, Provost. The, the motion before the Council this morning is that the Council approves the estimates for 1718, subject to the amendments from the administration which were tabled and circulated, uh, approves the recommended level of utilisation of reserves, determines the council tax ban D level at 1159.78 and notes that management of the council's finances and service plans will continue to be undertaken on a longer term basis. The amendment from Councillor Miller, seconded by Councillor Swift, is that the, S the papers originally circulated be, excuse me, be approved subject to the Conservative amendment that was circulated this morning. Those for the motion, could you please show? This is for 
Those voting for the amendment, could you please show? The vote is 13 for the motion and 6 for the amendment. The motion is carried. I'm curious about two things. There are two elements of education, one of which I raised earlier is in relation to nurseries and there is nothing, I notice there is nothing. It's an eight-year capital plan and despite Councillor Kane advising me that I should perhaps attend education more regularly, perhaps he should look at his capital plan a bit more regularly because there's nothing in there for those nurseries. And the local development plan proposes over another thousand houses which would fill up St Ninian's, it will be too full to work no matter, even using the new adjusted, reduced pupil product ratio numbers, we will need a new Catholic high school. Either that or we would choose to bus people from Newton Mearns to Barhead. So uh, can I ask the administration why these things are not in the capital plan? Councillor Swift, I think you've maybe jumped ahead to the actual capital plan. We're looking at item 12 at the moment, the capital investment strategy. Uh, can we approve the capital investment strategy? Great. Uh, general fund capital plan 2017-18 to 24-25. This report puts forward proposals for the Council's capital programme for the next eight years. As per usual, we are being asked to approve this at this stage of the 2017-2018 projects only. Future years will be subject to ongoing review. We are also being asked to authorise officers to, pro to progress the 2017-18 projects. I would now invite Councillor Fletcher to comment on the report. Thank you very much, Provis. Um, as mentioned in my previous presentation, the Council has experienced a period of significant financial constraints. Despite this, however, we continue to deliver massive levels of capital investment in our local area. The capital plan sets out a wide range of priority projects which will make a major contribution to the Council's strategic objectives. Over £131 million will be invested in capital projects over the next eight years and this is a huge boost to the local economy in these difficult times. We've been able to do that by strong budget management, generating efficiencies through a change programme and taking early decisions on savings. This has allowed us to build up substantial capital reserves which we are now applying to ensure that investment levels can be maintained all across the authority. It's particularly evident in the capital plan proposals to deliver and school facilities and both the new Barhead High School and the world's first joint faith, faith campus will open in the summer of this year. Um, in addition, we are completing a major upgrade for Kripfer Primary as well as the new family centre in Ochenbach. And the work is also starting on the new Maidenhill Primary and Nursery project. At the same time, the Council will continue to embrace in a partnership working with the ongoing investment in our sports centres which are now operated by the East Renfrewshire Culture and Leisure Trust, and of course the range of major in infrastructure projects being delivered via the City Deal, and uh, the announcement is taking place I think next Tuesday, which I believe I've invited Council Miller to attend, and I hope you make it along. Um, exciting and significant investment is therefore planned over the next few years, and I would commend this plan to the Council for approval and authorisation for officers to progress uh, work on all the projects in the next financial year. So we'll move, so move this um, capital plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Do we second that? You want to, Councillor Cannon, do you want to second that? Yeah, I'm happy to second the paper again uh, as has been laid out uh, by Councillor Fletcher. A very comprehensive plan uh, for the forthcoming years and obviously uh, I understand uh, Councillor Swift mentioned previously and is no doubt going to come in. 
But we plan for what we have and what we know at the moment. The current local development plan will deliver what it needs to deliver when that is fully agreed and any amendments would need to be looked at at that point in time. Thank you, Councillor Buchanan. Do you have any amendments? No. Uh, any member Page 240, number 2, City Deal. We asked at a previous meeting the new railway station for Barhead South, 10.292 million. What exactly do we get for that, considering the railway lines there? To get a station, so we're going to pay 10 million for a station. I think you actually said there was gardening as well. I've maybe changed my job. First of all, thank you, Provost. Uh, thank you, Provost. It was in relation to the absence of a new denominational high school and ten new nurseries and or what the mix of new nurseries are going to be like. And, and I did actually read the papers, Paul. That was very kind of you to comment on my lack of attendance. But then seeing as I have asked questions that have never been allowed to be asked, is there much point in me attending your meeting anyway? Moving on. So I, I would kind of like to see that. Yep. To expand on Councillor Robertson's point, which I do find rather interesting, is the city deal is supposed to generate, uh, if you like, wealth and gross, increased gross domestic product. I'm not so sure that, that putting a station and, and spending £10 million pounds of public money in a station that actually is SPT's responsibility, but they won't do it. So why are we wasting our money on doing something that could be perhaps better spent? Thank you, Councillor Swift. Councillor Green. Thank you very much, Provost. Um, I think that the Director has already answered part of the question from Councillor Swift, but we have increased nursery provision and early years. In, we will have in Maiden Hill, St. Haddock, the New Joint Faith Campus, Tart Mill and Auchinbach, and we are dealing with sufficient capacity as we know it now in St uh, Ninians uh, with, with the current local development plan and we have no intention of busing any children over to St Luke's. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Green. Councillor Buchanan. If I could address some of the issues in terms of uh, city deal and in terms of a railway station, yes, uh, a railway station is very much welcomed. Uh, one of the first things is for, yes, the rail line is there. Uh, hence the reason that we can put a station next to it and around it. Uh, that will also include other infrastructure works of road access points uh, and additional car parking as well. Uh, what it does do though is link up one of the things we've looked at across East Renfrewshire for many years is linking both sides of the authority uh, better than they currently are. That rail halt, uh, that rail station will improve the links between the Levern Valley side and the Eastwood side. That in turn enables it, makes it much easier for people to travel between the two. That creates job opportunities and growth which currently can be restricted because of the poor infrastructure or transport issues that linking up the authority. So that takes that forward. It makes that very important link. The actual construction is going to generate jobs. The other work in terms of city deal around Damsby Barley is also going to create further employment opportunities and the very process of linking that up with their great infrastructure to allow access to the area is vitally important. Hence the reason for the rail station there, hence the importance of that link in our network for not just East Renfrewshire but residents also looking at housing developments in the area in future years. When we take all of that into account, it provides better access for our residents, no matter where they may be going to work, it significantly improves access across East Renfrewshire. Councillor Devlin. So from North Mounds welcome the train station in Barhead because it will be easy of access for them to get to the city centre. Thank you, Kurt. Yes, ma'am. Item 14, Housing Revenue Account, Budget Approval. This report is asking us to consider the Housing Revenue Account for Budget for 2017-2018.
Can I just remind members that no decision on rent levels is being sought today, as at the meeting of the Council of the 12th of February 2015, it was agreed that a 4.9% rent increase, increase would be applied each April up to April 17. I would now invite Councillor Devlin to comment on the report. The purpose of this report is to seek approval for the proposed housing revenue account budget for 2017-18. Normally, the presentation of the HRA budget is accompanied by a proposal to approve a rent increase. However, members will recall that in February 2015, Council approved a rent increase for 2015-2018. to 2018. For this reason, it's not necessary to seek approval for a rent increase. However, approval is still required for the proposed housing revenue account budget for the forthcoming financial year. As convener, I am delighted with the performance of the housing service, as the report details we provide services that are of a quality, that are of a higher than the Scottish average, yet we continue to charge a rent that is lower than the Scottish average. The council is asked to approve the proposed housing revenue account budget for 2017-18. Thank you, Councillor Devlin. Do we have a second for Councillor Devlin for the report? Councillor Lafferty. Do you want to speak to it? Thank you. Do we have any amendments? Can we uh, approve it then? Yeah? Yes? Yeah. Hang on. Okay. Say that again. <laughs> Pass that to the federal person, Mr. Fowlders. No, 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 you're at the I don't know. I'm just I think that ties went to your head. Thank you. Can we agree the report? Councillor Devlin, could you put your microphone on? Aye, sorry. Uh, start again. Housing staff and <laughs> <laughs> Housing staff in conjunction with colleagues from other services and departments are continuously striving to ensure that quality is maintained and that any problem can be addressed as soon as they occur. Rigorous procurement methods are used to secure value for money. We are placing an increase in emphasis on customer care and getting it right for our customers and getting it right first time. To achieve this, we are engaging with our tenants before, during and after the process in order to listen, learn and improve. The Council is asked to improve the proposed housing capital programme from 2017-18 to 2022-23. Sorry? Yes, that's Should we have a second? Okay, 
Any comments? Councillor Smith? Microphone. Sorry, Thomas. I'll commence again. Uh, I'd be keen to understand uh, on page 267 we see 14.4 million for new build council housing. I'd be keen to establish what proportion of that money is likely to be spent on parks and green space because it seems from the new local development plan there would appear to be quite a substantial amount of council housing proposed for urban green space including parks. Yes, if I could just perhaps point out to Council, looking at page 267, paragraph 19, where there's a proposed rent increase of 4.9% next year. Can I point out to him that for our poorest and most vulnerable residents, a 4.9% increase in rent, a 3.3% increase in council tax, and a 1.6% increase in water rates means that they are going to take a hit on their already very small salaries of nearly 10%. Can My point is that this shows even greater justification for the cut of 6% in council tax. Thank you. Uh, just a brief point, uh, Provis. Uh, regardless of the merits of Councillor McCaskill's point, at least he is making a point on policy and the direction he wishes to follow. It does seem that an awful lot of members stand up and ask questions on fact, which could easily be answered by picking up the phone and talking to a council officer rather than grandstanding here in the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Lafferty. Can we agree the report? Agreed. Councillor Devlin, just... We'll move on. That concludes this morning's business. So thank you very much for your attendance.